Today, our keynote speaker is about to come up, our brother, Kalanji. You can, you can say it louder. Let's put our hands together for Kalanji, right? And I'm going to talk a little bit about him. We had the pleasure of a Panther talking to us today, and Brother Kalanji is going to bring together that Black Liberation Army, that Black guerrilla family, and talk to us today about the importance of organizing and what does self-determination mean for us. I'm going to read a little bit from a piece of paper. I hope you don't mind, because there's a long list of things that his brother has done and will do in the future. Kalanji Jamachanga is considered by many to be one of the most effective organizers in the United States. An active people's advocate, Kalanji has fought on multiple fronts tackling issues such as local and national police brutality cases to international human rights violations. Due to his dedication and tenacity, Kalanji has been featured on numerous media outlets including CNN, Al Jazeera, Press TV, and BBC News to name a few. Under Kalanji's direction as founder slash national coordinator of the FTP movement, programs such as International Feed the People, Urban Survival Preparedness Institute, Siafu Youth Corp, and National Coalition to Combat Police Terrorism have matured and developed. Kalanji is author of the best-selling book, How to Build a People's Army, and co-producer of the documentary, Organizing is the New Cool. Who agrees with that? Is organizing the new cool? Okay, I keep hearing comments about my outfits, but hopefully organizing is the coolest thing I got on. All right. <laughs> Kalanji currently serves as co-founder of Black Power Media. Who watches Black Power Media? Okay, all right. And most importantly, co-host of Gorilla Intellectual and University and host of RSTV. Everybody give a big, grandiose hand for our brother Kalanji and welcome in here with a... National Black Food Alliance, welcome. That's the, okay. Peace, how y'all doing? I'm gonna just say, y'all gonna put me at the Bob of Fred, y'all tripping. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm still stuck with my man talking about we even outsourcing sex on video. <laughs> I'm stuck at that, so I'm gonna get back to my, my regular schedule uh, program. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, where I am today. This is my first time uh, in Detroit. I've been invited to come to Detroit. This would be my sixth invitation, and it's the first time I've accepted. The other five times was between the months of November and February, and I was like, y'all bugging out. I'm not coming to cold <laughs> Detroit like that. I'm thinking it's going to be April, so it's going to be warm. <laughs> Joke's on me, right? Um, but I want to acknowledge the fact that this is the weekend um, of uh, the 54th year commemoration of the vamping of New Bethel Church here in Detroit, where they attacked the PGRNA, Republic of New Africa, and um, uh, ultimately one of these, um, what, what should I call them, snow roaches was killed. One of these pigs was shot down when they tried to kill our comrades. So we remember our comrades for their tenacity and for their right to self-determination because they had the right to defend themselves. Is that right? They convened. I'm sorry, did I offend anyone here? Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm against the police. I want y'all to be clear about that. We cool? All right, all right. I don't wanna, you know, let me know. 142 people met, just like we're meeting here today. And um, two police officers came and they attempted to intimidate some of the brothers who were on security. And they pulled out weapons and they weren't quick enough. So after one was dropped, they shot off the church, shot all through the church. You had people in there like Amari Obadelli. You had people in there like Baba Herman Ferguson, who was an ancestor, both ancestors. You had people in there like Ian Lua Ferguson. And you had a young Dr. Matulu Shakur. 
I interviewed Baba Herman Ferguson some years ago, uh, and he told me about Dr. Matulish Kaur being 14 years old at the time, 14, 15. And when they started shooting up this church, he was on security and he threw his elders on the floor and he laid on top of them to make sure that they wouldn't be shot. This is the same Dr. Matulu Shakur that was just released recently. You all familiar with Dr. Matulu Shakur? <laughs> the acupuncturist, the freedom fighter. That's revolution, right? Ain't that revolution? So we're here on this weekend and we're all honored to be here because of the fact that we're here with beautiful African people. I'm not saying that on no cliche mess, right? Y'all gotta excuse me because every now and then I'm, I'm 52 years old and a curse word might slip out every now and then. So I want y'all to hold me on it. It's, it's, it's out of love, right? So it's kind of difficult because y'all put me right in front of Bible so I'm watching the words every time it's happening. But um, I'm honored to be here because I'm here with so many beautiful African people. And I want to say, get started by saying that I love you. And when I say I love you, it's sincere, it's not game, it's not promotion, it's not for a head nod, a head clap. That's why I do what I do, because I love you. And hopefully by the time I finish speaking today, you'll feel the same way I feel about you for me. But if not, it'll be okay because I still love you, right? <laughs> I got a couple brothers and sisters that I know in the audience that'll probably be heckling. So security, make sure y'all <laughs> Show them the door if they get too loud. Yeah, no, 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 you don't have it, no. This one right here and that one in the back in particular. And him too, he's cool, but we never know. But anyway, these are my brothers, and shout out to Brother Ross Kofi, Deron, Bakir, and all other good folks out here that I've been knowing for years. Um, I want to start off by giving a, a, a real life bio. The comrade gave the, the organizational bio, right? So I want to give you some context because sometimes, as they say, if you don't know the author, you don't know what you're reading, right? So I want you to understand why I feel the way I feel. I want you to understand why I speak the way I speak, right? So we don't get it twisted, right? So I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. That's 45 minutes away from Harlem, or excuse me, the Bronx. Same radio, same TV, same crime, all that. Most of the time when people hear Connecticut, they think of some white folks. I don't know what Connecticut y'all know about, but that's not my reality. I grew up in the projects, the south end of Bridgeport. Um, and I was uh, what you call the white sheep of the family. My father say, go left, I go right. He say, don't do this, I'm doing that. You understand what I'm saying? So that's how it was um, during the 80s. I grew up in the, the whole crack era, right? And I started off, uh, you know, I, I was dealing with that plantation poison, distributing. And then I decided to become a juxman because the money was quicker. Don't worry about it. I, I, I was, I was, I was a, a, a black Robin Hood, right? So I was robbing other quote unquote drug dealers. I was, I think the statute of limitations is over. I was hitting some <laughs> at 14. I'm saying that I don't care, right? But I would take the money back home. I lived on the sixth floor and we'd make it rain in a different way. I'd drop it off out the window to make sure that our people was eating, to make sure that, that we was living like these other people downtown a few blocks away was living, right? So even though I was quote unquote on the wrong side of history, I was on the right side of the barricades. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm unapologetic about that because my goal and my aim was always to love us. I'm the son of a, a, a Trini father and a mother from South Carolina, country that she wanted to be. And they were strict. They didn't know what I was doing. I'm telling y'all right now, but they, they didn't play all that, right? Regardless, I wasn't gonna say, oh, I'm doing this for, back then they call it an ass whooping, part of my language, <laughs> if you get caught out of line. But um, I ended up at age 17, uh, getting captured, 
in South Carolina and I was facing 36 years. Uh, had no priors. I looked like a little geek. So, you know, judge was talking crazy country cracking. I was just, yes, sir, and all that, because I just wanted to get out. At age 18, I, you know, I was so happy that I turned 18 because I come from a place where violence was the norm, right? It was nothing for me to walk out down the stairs and see a trail of blood on the wall because somebody got shot the night before. It was nothing for me to find out that a friend of mine uh, overdosed in his mother's bathtub. You know what I'm saying? That, that, was, that was what it was, you know. But I'm not saying that to, you know, this ain't no sob story. That is the, the most community that I have experienced in my life, in my entire life, being a part of movement, dealing with all our beautiful African people. That was the most, out of my entire life, communal living, all of that, that was when I knew community most. So I grit my teeth in that. But also, I, I want to rewind a little bit. Also, not just the blood splatters and the overdose and all that. The police, we get off the elevator and they slam our head up against the wall to search us. We wouldn't even tell our parents because I ain't even want, you know what I mean? We didn't want folks to know what was going on. I'm 13 years old getting concussions because some cracker smashing my head up against the wall or kicking me in my tail, so on and so forth. We didn't just suffer peacefully, I'm going to say that. I'm not going to get into details about that. But just know that there was pain on both sides. Is everybody cool? All right, I don't want to scare y'all. Now, now that we got that out the way, um, when, I, when I told some folks that I was coming here to uh, speak to the National Black Food and Justice Coalition, Alliance, excuse me, or get jumped up in here. Um, folks was like, oh, you a farmer now? <laughs> Ross Kofi was one of them that said that. And my answer is yes, I am a farmer. When I say I'm a farmer, not in a traditional sense, I'm a freedom fighter, right? I don't necessarily raise food, even though I have a little garden. I raise communities. I plant seeds. And I got to deal with some bullshit every now and then to watch it grow. Ain't that farming? A farmer is a freedom fighter. A farmer is a revolutionary. That same machete that you use, it's a tool. It's a positive tool, and it's a positive tool. It's a tool for clearing the land, and it's a tool for clearing situation, right? <laughs> so in that sense, I'm a farmer. Um, I wanted to talk to you all today about war, because oftentimes we forget that we are at war. We forget that we are at war, because we, we get so excited about, you know, the black love part, and to quote Che Guevara, uh, paraphrase, he said, revolution is an act of love, right? We do what we do not because we hate anyone. We do what we do because we love us. Is that right? That is the reason we do this. Folks used to talk about, I'm angry. Oh, he's so mad all the time, so on and so forth. But then the folks that's closest to me, they like, and this cat, be on, he be joking all the time. But everybody don't see that because it's not for everybody, right? But... This uh, piece right here, and by the way, this is my first time ever doing a slide show presentation. So bear with me. I used, I used to think y'all was cheating when y'all was doing a slide show presentation. I'm like, man, they ain't doing nothing. Let, let, me, let me see if I can make this thing work now. Um, they ain't give me no instructions or nothing. They RPGs. Just, okay, we're going to start with a little bit of music. Y'all cool with that? You know what I mean? I gotta find out how to skip this war. thing too, y'all be with, bear with me. Me, uh -huh. stick. I mean, shit be real on the Pigs be out there, I can cry on me. Dude, skipping it all that. It's a takeover, not a makeover. 
Ah, okay, yeah. thank you. The cops ain't stop you just family, because right? you black, that's war. When you through the system for your prints, that's war. Dead when they friends. call my hood and drugs on, that's war. Slum lord charging you for this rent, is, uh, that's war. What am I OG? So uh, we call that's war. Really if you're young and right? black, you sell crack, that's so, war. The I, white I, house I, is the rock house, that's war. It, it tells a story. Mouth, that's war. It's that red. The red is for what? Gang, that's war. And the black is for what? And the green is for what? So what's that fist and that, that, that thing in it for? That's to protect and defend that, right? Right? They will teach you that when you fight back, that you are a tyrant or that you are a terrorist. You are a lover. You understand what I'm saying? To be a revolutionary is the most gangster thing you can come across, right? To be a farmer, I'm in love with the farmers because of the fact that, I mean, without the farmer, where you gonna get your food from? Huh? People, be, people keep talking about when they shut the grocery stores down, what you gonna do? We gonna go in the backyard or we gonna go out in the streets, right? Like Bobo was talking about, I co-chaired uh, an organization called the Urban Survival Preparedness Institute. And one of the things we talk about is if you're not prepared, when it goes down, you're gonna have to deal with the community, right? And that's a good thing because of the fact that if you're not building your community, you ain't doing nothing. We're gonna talk about community today because of the fact that there's so many folks that call themselves organizers, but they're so arrogant with it that they ain't organizing nothing in their community. How you a community organizer, you can't organize your own community. How you organize organizer, you don't even know your neighbors. That sounds like confusion to me. Decolonization. Decolonization is a political process that refers to the undoing of colonialism, which is the exploitation and subjugation of a territory, people or resources by a foreign power. This process seeks to dismantle the structures and policies that maintain colonial rule and to restore sovereignty and autonomy to the colonized people. Now, decolonization is the word of the day, right? Because we have to, we agree that we are in a colony, right? And we must also agree that capitalism and imperialism is our enemy, right? We can't buy our way out of this. We're gonna be able to vote our way out of this. We're gonna be able to rap our way out of this. Eventually, we're gonna have to get physical, right? And it don't mean that everybody gotta, you know, put your dukes up. It means that you're gonna have to use that manual labor, right? In order to nation build. We got people talking about nation building, but they scared to get dirt under their nails. They talking about nation building, they talking about these bugs over there. <laughs> we be tripping. Our people are confused. Our people are so confused that they actually think that they're thinking. And they would argue with you. And they would debate you. And they want to fight you. Because you are doing. Theory, out, theory without practice is dead. It's nothing. It's nothing. We rap so well, we the greatest rappers alive because that's what we do. We could talk that jive, right? When it comes to the work, there ain't no work. What Malcolm say, we bleed when the white man says bleed. But it's time for us to shed blood for our people. We ain't got no blood. We talked about a war and we, already, we know about the war terms. We know Lyndon Johnson, a lot of folks credit him for the, uh, the Voter Registration Act. I was just in Selma uh, hosting something for Bloody Sunday, that commemoration where they beat our brothers down, brothers and sisters and children on the bridge, 500 something people, these white folks on horseback, these pigs beat us down, beat old ladies down, so on and so forth. And they said, well, we're gonna pass the Voter Registration Act. And everybody was cool. Just the same dude that he came with the whole war on poverty but then immediately after he came with the war on crime, the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968. Then you got Nixon. They used to call him Tricky Dick. Yeah, Nixon, Tricky Nixon. He talked about fighting the war against the enemy within. Who was he talking about? Huh? Was he talking about white folks? Was he talking about the Patriots? Um, he, he the one that came with the whole war on drugs. And then of course Reagan came with his mission and Clinton remixed what Lyndon B. Johnson had and Bush came with the war on terror. And all of it was about the expansion of a police state and what we call enslavement. Some people call it the new Jim Crow. It's the same thing, it's just remixed. 
They ain't nothing new about it. They might, they might have made it more palatable for you because they know that we like to, we like the perception of power opposed to power, right? The, the rap group, the hip hop group, Lil Brother, they had a song and in their song, one of the quotes was, do you really want to look good or do you want to, I mean, excuse me, do you really want to win or do you want to look good losing? We always look so damn good losing. We're impressed with nothing, right? We, 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 we will, whatever we can get to make it seem like we're advancing, then we're cool with that. I remember back in the day, everybody used to wear the jewelry, the gold chains and everything and the rings and all that. And poor black folks would wear everything they had, everything they had on them. One robbery and all that's empty. You understand what I'm saying? They was buying it from these Asian stores. And it was fool's gold, it was pyrite. But they didn't know it. They was paying $800, $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. And that's just folks I knew in the projects. You in the projects with nothing, but you still stunting. You can't pay the light bill. You got an eviction notice. You on the bus. But you look good. That's what we. That's how we roll. That's not how we roll, right? It's a different time. This is uh, John Ehrlichman, um, Nixon's uh, former president. On, uh, I mean, excuse me, assistant uh, for domestic affairs. He talked about. Uh, you want to know what this drug war? This is an interview. He talked about. You want to know what the war, drug war was really about? And basically, he said that. Nixon's White House had two enemies. It was the anti-war left and black people. This is what Nixon's man is talking about. It's not me, it's not a conspiracy theory. I didn't pull this out my hat. He said, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be anti-war or black, but we knew that uh, by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. He said, did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. War. When you talk about the United States government being at war, when you talk about the United Nations, when you talk about NATO, these cronies for the United States, when you talk about France, and you talk about uh, uh, England and, and, and some of these other criminals out here, this is about domination, destruction, and death. The one thing that we fail to realize, and I think that part of the reason that we're in the conditions we're in today besides fear, is that we're still looking at this beast from as if they're humane, if they have some humanity in them, right? So we look at them as if they, they wouldn't do that. They can't do that. that. That's the thing I love when I'm talking to people. They, they can't do that. We have rights. We, we have rights. Imam Jamil, formerly H. Rap Brown, he's locked up right now. They snatched him up. They kidnapped him. Doc, Dr. Matula Shakur is just getting out. Mumia Abu Jamal just denied uh, an evidentiary hearing yesterday. All these folks, no evidence, no scientific evidence, no physical evidence but yet they've been sent upstate. Why? Because they want to make an example out of us, right? They want to make an example for us. They want us to understand that as, as the FBI talked about, the youth need to know that if they're going to be revolutionaries, they'll be dead revolutionaries, right? What you're doing right now is a revolutionary act like the brother was talking about. So you might as well go all the way out. Don't stop there. They're already going to criminalize you. They're already going to demonize you, right? You already can't use your own seeds, right? It's an act of war. Gentrification is genocide. It's an act of war. It is about destroying communities, destroying families. And we have to be clear. We don't, have, we don't need no nice terms for brutal realities. This is about murder. This is about our annihilation. Is about our extermination. 
That's why they, they're rushing things like artificial intelligence. Because they want you to believe that you are absolute. I mean, obsolete. They want you to believe that you have no value. But I'm here to tell you, your most valuable asset besides life itself is your time. It's the one thing you can't get back. Money will come and go, but you can't get no time back, right? They know that, and they will waste your time. And you have people in the so-called community that will waste your time. We have what we call thieves of time. They'll steal your time. You can't even get it back. They'll have you caught out on some BS. You sitting there going back and forth debating with some clown on social media who's probably a plant. It's probably a plant. And you sitting there going back, they said such and such. Imam Jamil said, you know, the white man to tell you that, uh, no, you don't want freedom, you want to marry my daughter. Now you going back and forth arguing about whether or not you want to marry their daughter. <laughs> this is how confused we are. I like this, this move kind of quick. <laughs> I'm, right, I'm working on a um, co-author in a book called African Art of War. With, a, with one of my comrades, Balogun Ojetade. He's the founder of the African Martial Arts Institute, and um, he's also co-chair of the Urban Survival Preparedness Institute. And so the next few slides are gonna be about different titles that we're using in the book, but we're gonna utilize them in a way that works for the organizer, right? Because when we're talking about war, again, war is not just two opposing forces with guns. There's all types of war, there's psychological war, there's uh, nutricide, there's different types of genocide, or, you know, there's, there's, you know, war is war, everything that comes with it. So political education, you know, political education is important because of the fact that if you don't know who and what you're fighting for, you'll be confused about who and what you're against. So when we talk about white supremacy, you'll get folks talking about, well, the cops in Memphis that beat Tyree Nichols down was black. We'll be confused. We'll think that that's not, they're not operating under a white supremacist construct. We'll act like that they're not the running dogs for the state. So with white supremacy, you don't need white folks to run up in your neighborhood. You got Negroes who are trained. You got Negroes that have come destroy your gardens. They'll complain, we, we, we over here planting all this stuff over here, there's gonna be some rodents over here. They'll be wanting to shut you down for feeding people. Self-hate. So that political education, again, is important um, because we need to be clear about who we for and who we against. Master your terrain. When organized, it's important to understand the importance of communities, value, power dynamics, and lived experiences as key factors in successful community organizing. What does that mean? It means that oftentimes as organizers, we go to these different communities and we're so arrogant that we think that the people, we know what the people want better than the people know. You set up shop. I mean, we have more respect for street organizations or so-called gangs than we do the people themselves. Because even with Bloods and Crips, they're not just gonna set up and say, I'm, I'm just set up right here. You just can't go set up on somebody's block. But as organizers, you step on in, you know you got your 501, 3C or C3, whatever it is. You, <laughs> oh, that's new to me. You tap on in there. And you set up shop and you telling the people what they need. You don't know nothing about the community's values. You don't know about the traditions. You don't have relationships with nobody. I know a particular organization, they set up shop. They beefing with everybody in the neighborhood. And it's the neighborhood's fault. This is the arrogance. That right there, that is a throwback to white supremacy. You understand what I'm saying? It's just like the settlers, they come in too and they're, they're the missionaries. We're gonna save the savages. You Negroes need this. And we're gonna set it up right here. They're not in tune with the power dynamics. Who are the people that have influence in the neighborhood, in the community? That's who you wanna get with. One thing about organization, we have, um, we have the FTP movement, but the CIFU movement is the, the larger umbrella. 
And the beauty of what it is that we do is that we, A, not only work together and we not only show each other love, but we identify the organizations with strength, right? Much like what you all doing here when you're talking about this alliance, right? You have different forces that are coming together for a common cause. That's how we're supposed to operate. But we don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? You have organizations talking about, well, we doing this. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You ever get in a convo with, with another organizer and they telling you what they're doing? Oh, we over here. Every time you say, well, we about to be, well, we, over, we doing this and what we doing, who the hell is we? We supposed to be 13, 14% of the U.S. population, but we got like 8 million organizations just in Detroit. So it's like what Malcolm talked about, the fingers and the hand, the fingers and the fists. You ain't knocking nobody out with your pinky finger. You know what I'm saying? So with this whole power dynamic, again, being clear about who the folks are that have been putting in that work, who are the elders in the community, right? I slipped up today because I was supposed to ask the elders for permission to speak. So I apologize and I hope that I do right. But not only that, had I put it together and, and I'm grateful to be the keynote, but I wouldn't have went on after Baba. That, that, that's not for nothing else but, but just the fact that his wisdom, he's been here before I was. You understand what I'm saying? And that's not a disrespect to you all, I respect the organizers, right? But I'm just saying, he should be honored and revered, right? So I don't ever want anyone to mistake because we have all these folks who talking about, you know, they're leaders and they're the prince of this. I'm the prince of Pan-Africanism when I'm the... <laughs> all this far out shit. <laughs> they out here building schools. They ain't show y'all a number two pencil or a chalkboard. Y'all just pouring y'all money in there. Give them the money. I'm sorry, I know I'm getting off course. <laughs> Stealth organizing. Controlling the narrative. One thing we was talking about with uh, one of my comrades, uh, Daruba, we was talking about how we have to organize our own press conferences. And we give the media what we want to give them. The state, the media, the press is the propaganda arm of the establishment. They're not friends, they won. Siamese twins. They say we're together on this track. That, that's, that's, that's who they are. That's their goal. So they're going to take whatever you give them, they're going to flip it and mix it up. They're going to water it down. We being such a hungry per people, we just happy with they, they, they talked about the farm on the news today. No, the hell with that. We hold our own press conference with media that we respect and that respect us. And then we send them the clip. You got some questions? We'll give you the answers back. Is that wrong? This right here was a, uh, an actual press conference. Yeah, floor, now, for a question from the co-chairs, uh, and uh, Congressman Cynthia McKinney. One could argue that the name of the group, uh, the Coalition to Combat Police Terrorism, is a, a challenging name, perhaps a slightly incendiary name. Oh, okay, let me answer that. And the, oh, let, me, let me finish my question. And, and there's been criticism that uh, anger in the community fueled the killing of the two police officers in New York. Do you have a responsibility to exercise restraint in terms of that kind of rhetoric? No. Uh, uh, let, me, let me be very clear. That's why, we have, that's why we share a coalition here, you see. I'm going to say what's true, whether you like it or not, or whether you think it's combat or not. First of all, the United States uses war terms in almost every policy that it implements, domestic and foreign. What's the war on terror? What's the war on drugs? What's the war on crime? What's the war on poverty? War is a, it's like a belligerent term, don't you agree? Hmm? Hmm? So the use of terms to combat means that, to combat. 
we're not here to determine other people's political agenda. We're not here to tell other people how to think. We don't represent the politics of the Gardner family. We don't re represent the politics of the Brown family. They're in grief, they lost their child, it launched a movement. They are not our political leaders. This coalition says what it is to combat police terrorism because the police are terrorizing us and have been terrorizing us for what, 400 years now? They're the descendants of the Patty Rollers, remember them from New York? They're the descendants of the Ku Klux Klan. They're the descendants of the militias that used to go hunt slaves and run them down. That's what the police, that's how they police our community. Huh? If you think that that history is not worthy of the term combat, then you need to be 12 years a slave. Hmm? So yes, we don't have no obligation to tone down our rhetoric. Who do we have an obligation to? CNN? To you? To white folks? Do we have an obligation in this society as the victims of white supremacy in this country to reform white supremacy? Do we have an obligation to make you feel better about yourself and better about your country? No. The coalition is to combat police terrorism. Do you think there are any police That was an actual press conference that we had. That's our organization, one of our organizations, the National Coalition to Combat Police Terrorism, which is co-chaired by former U.S. Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney and former, uh, excuse me, veteran BLA co-founder Duru Ben Wahad. So this is an example of what I'm talking about. We know that they wasn't going to air that. So if we do invite the press, we have our press out there as well, and we record both sides. Because when the six o'clock news came, it was a whole different story. A group of terrorists led by such and such, boom, boom, boom. So we was able to combat what it is with our own propaganda. This is how we gotta move. Never have a press conference when you're not recording it. You always, if you're gonna deal with the press, with their press, make sure you document what's being said and stick to the script, right? And we don't let, allow everyone to just get up in front of the camera just because they got a mouth. We have to organize without relying on digital platforms. Social media is state sponsored. I don't care. You can say, well, TikTok is from state sponsored, right? A few weeks ago, our, our platform, Black Power Media, we got a strike, a strike on our channel. So we were suspended, shut down for a week for a week and folks panicked. Oh, what you gonna do? Oh, oh man, how y'all gonna do? We're organizers. Let me tell y'all something, man. I'm a co-founder of Black Power Media and I don't even like YouTube. I don't even like what I do. I do this because it's necessary to get the job done. We gotta utilize whatever tools we can utilize. I had a, I mean, it break my heart when I'm in the community and folks like, oh yeah, I know you on YouTube. I'm like, damn, that's all I get. <laughs> out, of all, out of all my work, I'm just a YouTuber. My, one of my comrades' daughters saw me on, uh, was watching me on YouTube. They said, oh, that's my man, such and such. Nah, that ain't him, that's Kalanji, he's a YouTuber. <laughs> we have to build relationships and networks, right? We gotta take it back old school. One of the things I was talking to uh, Abiel Doom, Abby, last night, canvassing going door to door, knowing your community, right? If you ain't doing that, you ain't doing nothing. You're not organizing. Are you organizing? You ain't organizing in the community. A lot of these folks is ambulance chasers. Soon as such and such gets shot, they over there. This program's going on, they over here. Hickam Cop City, they over here. We gotta get a grip. We gotta decide what side of the barricades we're gonna be on. We have to make sure that when we talk about community organizing, we start in a home, the neighborhood, but most of us forgot what a neighborhood is. Most of us don't even know what a community is. So if you don't know something, then it don't exist. Then we talk about growing from there. Right now, they got us chasing our own tail. We already know that the police are gonna murder someone. There's someone that day that will be murdered by the police. I'm sorry, you don't wanna hear it like that, but that's just the reality. The police here in the United States kill between 1,000 and 1,500 people a year, every year. In 10 years, 
more people have been murdered than some of the, the residents of certain small towns. In, 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 in uh, College Park, Georgia, I think the, the, the population is somewhere around 14,000 or something. So within 10 years, you can wipe out the whole College Park just with the number of people that was murdered by the police. So we expect that. We can't be reactionary, right? We can't be reactionary. We have to prepare. If you don't prepare, then you lose. We have to set up designated community info hubs for the sake of organizing demos, teachings, and programs. What do I mean by that? We have places we, we frequent, barbershops, certain stores, black owned businesses, so on and so forth. We have to put the word out so when the people come through, listen, there's gonna be a demo that says it says blah, 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 not just throw it on Facebook. You against the state, but then you showing the state, we're gonna be mad over here tomorrow. Then you bugging out talking about the, 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 the pol there's a lot of police out there, you think? <laughs> I mean, we be bugging out. Sister called me a couple months ago talking about some, yeah, brother, uh, I, I just want to know how you, uh, where do I go to get a permit to protest? <laughs> I'm sorry, sister, what'd you say? Yeah, brother, I just want to know where do I get a permit to protest? I said, I don't understand your question. She said, what don't you understand? I said, sister, for me, if I'm upset, I'm not asking the people I'm upset about to give me permission to be upset. That defeats the purpose. I've been organizing literally 37 years. 37 years. And guess what? I've never, I don't even know where to go get a permit from. I've organized all over the country. I don't care about no damn permit. When they get there, I want them to know that we upset. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm not, now I know, you know, the nonprofit world a little different. Some of y'all get some grants and everything. Look, we can't do that. I'm with y'all. But the bottom line is when you upset, you have to be positively displeased, right? Anyway, but setting up these info hubs, we gotta, you know, that's a way to keep infiltration down. Right now, you know, coming from Atlanta, we have, uh, it's, a, it's a strange thing going on. Of course, Atlanta's known as the Black Mecca. Y'all have heard that before, right? You know, Mecca's a desert, so I, I unite with that. Um, for the first time ever, I'm seeing white youth leading the rallies and the marches in the street. That's strange to me, because when I was out on the street regularly, white folks would come out there, but we let them know out the gate, you can get down what we're doing, but you don't run shit. Don't, don't, don't talk too loud if we don't say don't talk. You know what I'm saying? And I, be, I wish you would break something out here because we got babies out here. But now what's happening is you can't tell them from the state because the infiltrators are sprinkled in. Now, I'm not trying to knock nobody because of the fact that some people are like, well, you know, you're speaking out. And I'm not speaking out. I'm just telling you all the facts. You know, we look at Cop City in the beginning. I noticed there was a number of folks that were being arrested and they were saying, okay, this one's from Seattle, Washington, and Kennebunkport, Maine, and these are white folks coming to Atlanta to, to fight for, you know what I'm saying? It's, you know, it's kind of strange and breaking up shit. So we have to be careful with who we organizing with, right? I know some of y'all believe that uh, your enemy's enemy is your friend, but sometimes your enemy's enemy is your enemy too. I ain't gonna be long, y'all. Work with me. Again, communication and, and, and uh, communicate and coordinate. We already know. Everybody knows about know about COINTELPRO. You know what I'm saying? We know about counterinsurgency. Um, it is not over. Change names, change forms. You know what I'm saying? Um, nowadays, if you're an organization that's been around 50 years or more, and you ain't had no problems with the state, then I question who you are. You understand what I'm saying? Kwame Tori said, if I'm chasing my enemy and my enemy ain't chasing me, then what am I doing wrong? And that's not a badge of honor. I'm just saying like, you know, you, you out here doing what you say you doing. Nobody got arrested. Let me stop for y'all start thinking about organizations and whatnot and thinking I'm pointing fingers. A lot of the people that we see out here are operatives of the state. I talked about ambulance chasers. You have folks out here, certain attorneys, every time somebody's shot, they on the scene. 
I mean, how you gonna win a case if you every day and wear? Huh? I don't want an attorney that's everywhere, but the thing is, our people are so desperate. Our people are so desperate that just to have a figurehead represent you is like a victory. We don't need any more figureheads. We need victory. This woman right here is one of my OGs, one of my elders, one of my ancestors, Ia Fulani Sunni Ali. Um, she was one of my generals. Lead from the front. As an African in a position of leadership, it is essential to lead by example. Do not ask your comrades to do anything that you are not willing to do yourself. Oftentimes we see organizations and the leadership, they don't know how to get dirty. They want you to clean the toilets, they want you to do the grunt work, but they don't get down in the streets. You know what I'm saying? When the police come, they're never there. When it's time to go to court, they're never there. But when it's time to, to be on the news, they're front and center, right? We have to lead by example. If you call yourself a leadership, I mean a leader, or if anyone else calls you a leader, we have to make sure that we're showing proven. Community control of public safety. Now, a lot of folks was jumping up and down a few years ago talking about defund the police. It's a very ridiculous statement. We're in a capitalist society. We agree that it's a police state. We're in a milita militarized industrial complex, over 900 military bases around the world, and we talk about defund the police. Does that make sense to you all? Just take the gun, take the money from the guns and put them over there. Okay. That's like asking a bear to be a vegetarian. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I know you're a pit bull, but I'm going to talk to you. We're going to groom you up. We're going to give you a uh, manicure and put on a bow tie. And we're just going to bring you around the babies because you're cute now. It's not going to happen. We have to take control of our own public safety. Now, oftentimes it's easier said than done. Folks are like, you know, how do you do that? It's called organizing, right? We have to take, put our decision-making powers into the community's public safety and wellness. We need to get, that's why it's important to organize these residents, right? So we talk about decentralizing the police. When we talk about decentralizing the police, we're talking about getting rid of these police chiefs. Because what you will find is in the police state of America, of the United States, a cop will get fired over here and be rehired down the street. The chief of police who you all bigged up in Memphis because she was this black woman, black girl magic, bigged her up because of the fact that you said, well, you know, she fired them dudes right away. But she's from Atlanta. She was over the Red Dogs at one point. Red dogs are responsible for murdering 92 year old Captain Johnston, right? She was fired in Atlanta because of the fact that uh, she had a friend on the force, a subordinate whose husband was involved in some pedophilia. He was involved in child pornography. And she told the other officers to stand down because that's her friend. They found out what was going on and she ended up getting fired. And she ended up through the police unions, which, are, which is the most ruthless group of individuals in the country. They got her a job back. So she ended up moving to Durham. She got a job in Durham and then she moved up to Memphis. And everybody was applauding her because she moved so swiftly and so quickly. She just didn't want everybody to know what the deal was. You know what I'm saying? Again, we don't get caught up in black faces in high places. We have to be clear about who's who and what's what. Our enemies are our enemy, regardless of how they look, regardless of their gender. You understand what I'm saying? We, we have to figure out what side of the barricades they're on. We, with with this decentralization, we're talking about putting together police boards that are elected by the people, right? Sort of like a school board, you know? 
we vote in who's gonna, the representatives for that particular board. And through that, these are the people that we deputize to hire the police. The police that work in our communities, we believe that there should be a residency clause. You should live in the community that you serve for a minimum of three years, right? If Bob is a, a police officer, it's less likely that he's gonna abuse my son because we all go to the same church, we go to the same supermarket, we're in the same neighborhood, and, 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 and Bob here, he's like, yo man, I can't believe you beat, you know what I'm saying? You know, you watch this boy grow up. You know what I'm saying? Or at the least, you might lump him upside his head and send him home and look, he over here, you know, get him in order, I don't wanna take a man. That's what community is about. Any of y'all remember that type of community? Then when you knew the police officers in the neighborhood, anybody remember that? Yeah, I mean, we don't remember it. It's a whole nother world. But we're talking about being able to uh, have a residency clause so that you can feel more comfortable going outside, living, so on and so forth. Um, putting a referendum on the ballot to make sure that we decentralize. So um, along with that, one of the things that our organization does is we train, we have a brother who's a combat medic and he's a combat medic for over 26 years. And he doesn't train, he doesn't just talk about, you know, first responders or whatever, that particular job or position. He trains brothers and sisters on how to stop bleeding, how to deal with, with certain medical crises, right? <laughs> so that we don't have to call the police, we don't have to call the ambulance. Or if you stabbed or you shot, we can keep you alive to the ambulance takes their 30 minutes or so to come get to you. You know what I'm saying? Um, I know I'm, 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 I'm pressed on time and I didn't even know I was moving so quick. Land is the basis of power. Malcolm said revolution is based on land. Land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. The white man knows what a revolution is. Um, in order to, for you to have your land, you must train and equip. You wanna make sure that you have folks that can defend your property. Um, it's some basics I'm not going to get into, but I, I want to say real quick as I close that as I look around the room, I can't do it like that. Okay. 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 Hey, hey, listen. Okay. What do you think? Oh, you, oh, I'm sorry. It was a soda we saw. I'm tripping. It wasn't a, I love a soda. Don't get to go back two more. Okay. What happened? I was on the Frederick slide. Thank you. I, I told you I didn't know to work this damn thing. I got nervous. <laughs> anyway, empty demands will get you nowhere. We already know uh, Fred Douglas's quote. What I was going to say real quick as I look around the room, thousands of acres of land are in this room. Am I wrong? Thousands of acres of land are in this room, or we're connected to even more, right? But you have to do more than just growing, right? We have to build municipalities. Right? We have to train. We have to organize. We have to get people living on this land. Right? We got to use, we have to be able to defend this land. Because as Baba pointed out, yes, they will come for it. Right? You're not just going to be, you know, saying I got 70 acres and it's not going to be challenged. We still live under the empire. Right? So I just want to remind you all as we move forward hook up with some of your comrades or some people that are organizers that have the ability to uh, bring us together and, 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 and move us forward. Because as the preacher used to say, it's getting late in the evening. Um, I appreciate my time with you all. I hope I didn't bore you to death. Uh, I'm grateful, gratitude, and I pray that we win. Good. Thank you so much. Man. For sure. How was that, everyone? Are we feeling charged up? Are we ready to organize? Do we say organize, fight, and win? Might want to stay there, Kalanji, because people got some questions for you. We're going to take a couple questions. I thought I, thought I overdid it. I was like, oh. You did overdo it, my brother. No, I'm playing. Okay. <laughs> We're going to get a couple questions till 1245. Who wants okay. to go first? I'm sorry, I was nervous. I didn't think I could feel it all that much, and I didn't realize I went past it. My bad. Peace. Is it on? Okay. I'm Tenor from iLogic. Um, my question is about decentralizing, decentralizing these colonial power structures, right? 
Um, I, I was struck when you said a moment ago that we need to be creating municipalities. And I wonder how you look at recreating the structures that we are trying to deconstruct. And so in the development of community that's going to be sustainable and last into the next iteration of things and be the creation of new iterations, what does it look like to build community in structures that are not associated at all with the colonial process? Okay, so you're talking about independent land, is that correct? Okay, that, that's the best part. Because the thing is, you know, again, what they say, those who know don't tell, those who tell don't know. You can build what you want to on your land. We don't have to have red, black, and green draws on and the flag flying up in the middle of uh, white lady North America. We can just build and grow. We can have families. We do things as if we're family, right? As an organization, we don't have to have t-shirts and tattoos. You understand what I'm saying? We just say, look, this is my brother, this is my sister, so on and so forth, and that's the script. We have a mass line and we have a party line. The mass line is what we tell them, the party line is how we get down, right? So to me, that's the best part right there. When you can say, if you say you have 70 acres of land and you have the capacity to build, then we create our own rules. We create our own governance. We don't have no, I'm sorry, we, we don't have any uh, one man leadership or rulership, right? We have to have that power to elect. And we don't, one of the problems we have with organizing as well is you'll have the same leadership for like 20, 30 years. And they passed their time like 20, 30 years ago. We gotta have some type of process. We vote when, in, under white folk system. When it comes to our thing, we forget about it. You know what I'm saying? We too busy just trying to decide which came first, the, 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 the chicken or the egg. You know what I'm saying? We, we confuse. So I think that, again, what does it look like? We have some of the most brilliant minds on the planet. I met with a school from uh, some youngsters from Louisiana a couple weeks ago. And, you know, they're doing great work. And one of the elders, he's like, yeah, we was over there. You know, the white folks over there, you know, we outscored them in this, we outscored them in that. I said, listen, I told the youth, I said, man, as much as I love the work you're doing, I'm not impressed by you telling me that you outscored white folks. You the OGs of the planet. You the original gorillas, you, you, made, you built this. So why am I gonna be impressed you tell me that you did what should be the obvious, right? So again, we, we, we build and we grow. And it, it comes from, from organization. And, and the one thing that I'm grateful about our organization is it's more of a family type situation. You know what I mean? We know each other's where we live. We, we, you know, a child is born, we're there for the birth. You know what I'm saying? Somebody's graduating. I don't care if they graduate from the third grade. We're in the crowd. Yeah! We acting a fool for a third grader. Preschool graduation, anything. Nobody better not say nothing. You know what I'm saying? So we, we build that organization has to be, be about family. Because if it's just about you going to a meeting every now and then, it's not going to work. Uh, shout out to this hugely important conversation that has been happening. Thank you, Baba Fred. Uh, much res I'm a Bia Dune Henderson um, with Gangsters to Growers. I appreciate you, Kalanji. When are you going to come and teach PE to ga the Gangsters to Growers? Um, and I'm asking you in front of everybody Call so you can't up, play man. me off. <laughs> Give I'll, me a compliment and then I'll, be like, I'll, all right, sister. I'm with no. you. Call me, call me, um, call me. Anyway, <laughs> get, uh, I got it on record. She's going to wait till I get to Detroit to say that. That's cold. <laughs> colder than a white man, ain't she? So, you know, I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, shout out to, like, all the things that you're saying about the organizing piece, the, the making sure we have institutions before we we tear down the institutions that are holding us captive. Uh, it's all about us like really building, I don't know if I have a question, darn it. Um, right. Shout out to Fox Fire Farm for having built cabins on their land where they were able to shelter people during storms. 
and it happens repeatedly. Shout out to organizers like folks from Saffron that has 144 farmers with over 3,000 acres that need infrastructure and the same model that Foxfire has. They need the same thing on their land so that we can be really prepared for the emergencies that are happening. Thank you for the Alliance for continuing and I hope we have a, continue to have a huge push into giving black folks that already have land what they need to produce the food, get the labor and build climate safe housing on their land because the time is now. So just shout out to Alliance for these two sessions in this morning and I hope in the afternoon, that's what we talking about. I appreciate it. Abby Adun is, is my sister and I'm glad that she did a shout out to, I don't know none of y'all, but anyway, <laughs> I was like shout out to African people, how about that? But thank you though. Brian from Brian Tenney from Sankara Farm. Uh, I just uh, thank you, Kalanji, for you know coming and sharing with us. Uh, I just wanted to maybe hear you speak to a little, little bit to the, the our radical imaginations and how you know Gorilla, um, the Dragon. I mean George Jackson. I mean that's one of the, my favorite uh, uh, things from Black Power Media, which you know a strong a strong propaganda arm to really you know help us focus and connect you know the connective tissue between us. But yeah, could you speak a little bit to, you know, uh, on a, you know, guerrilla intellectual or, you know, the, uh, what kind of uh, a metaphor, you know, the ants, the mushrooms, yeah. mycelium, what kind of metaphor? Uh, no doubt. Should... So our logo, the Siafu is an ant. Um, it's an ant out of uh, Kenya, East Africa. Uh, the ant is blind, it grows to an inch. And um, with it, it's, uh, they work together. You know, I was watching a, um, a, a, uh, I think it was Animal Kingdom or something like that. Uh, one night, it's like two, three o'clock in the morning. And I see this frog leap into this pile of ants. And like within an hour, it's like, there's really no evidence that the frog was there. Because the ants got busy on it, right? And, you know, they, they were able to strip down water buffaloes and, um, you know, they build bridges. Like I said, they're blind, but they work together. So that's the logo that I chose for the organization for FTP and Siafu movement. We call ourselves Siafus because the ant is all, all oftentimes overlooked. And ants are everywhere. You understand what I'm saying? There's ants, it's probably some ants in this building right now. You know what I'm saying? But they're, they're overlooked. So we looked at that. But to answer your question, um, we like to use what I call creative resistance. You know, we use the cherry cough drop theory. We make it taste so good, they forget it's medicine. You understand what I'm saying? So we do everything from hip hop and, and, and CDs and whatnot. Ross Kofi's on a few of our projects. We had a joint we did called Crew Love where we'd have um, you know the artists come in and you might not be a quote unquote political artist, but the host would, would drive the politics and we had that flavor going in it. We had um, a joint we did called Poets for Political Prisoners where we have different you know world renowned poets, everybody from uh, Sonny Patterson to the last poets, Amir Suleiman and Abyss, so many others um, who just would come spit poetry. Um, and between them, we would have uh, different freedom fighters, OGs and veterans and organizers drop a few words and then we keep on to the joint so that we can attract the masses. You know, we all have a role to play in movement, right? So sometimes we discount people. We say, well, they, they ain't revolutionary enough. You know what I'm saying? I work with some folks who are unlikely, you know, you might see us with a, a killer mic or a TI or somebody like that, but we can get them on, we have points of unity where we can make them do some things that need to be done. And we're not trying to change everybody's politics. This is for the masses, you understand what I'm saying? So what you like, I might not like, but if I'm an organized, I need to at least tap into what it is that you're into. You understand what I'm saying? I can't just, because I like muddy waters, we just gonna be blasting muddy waters because you know what I mean? To the youth, it don't, we don't get down like that. But I also want to give credit to one of my, my close comrades and brothers of 20 years, Deron Manifest Chavis right here. Because, because he epitomizes creative resistance as well. He started the Happily Natural Day. Um, and it's the 20 year commemoration this year. And I hope, hopefully I'm gonna see y'all in August. We teamed up probably around 06 or something like that. 
Yeah, in 2006. And, um, you know, we grew and then, you know, we was doing the Black August Organizing Committee. I was a part of uh, the Black August Organizing Committee. So we was doing Black August and we've been, Black August has been in existence over 40 something years. But I knew that Duran was doing Happily Natural in, uh, in Richmond. So we eventually teamed up and we was doing Black August weekend in Atlanta. So with Black August weekend, it was Black August slash Happily Natural, Happily Natural, because of the fact that we knew that politically, everybody's not gonna get down with the concept of political prisoners, but everybody wanna be natural. Everybody like culture, you know what I'm saying? Music, so on and so forth. So we combined the two and we were able to educate and inspire and get people down with the movement. There are a number of different people right now that are in movement and struggle just based on coming to the events. You understand what I'm saying? So that's what we talk about right there. And we talk about that whole creative resistance, being able to reach the masses beyond the two, three people who are in our, in our little clique. Oh. Um, so I got a question around um, community policing and um, creating um, community policing. Um, how do we create community policing um, when and I'm trying to get my words right. So you talked about having that community and remembering that community. How do we create healthy community policing? Because I, I, my mother tells me stories about that community and can't walk, can't get in trouble at school and walk past her neighbors without getting a whooping. But it's also another side to that. She also tells the story of abuse from those that my grandmother trusted to be community. So how do we create healthy community policing where we don't further cause harm to our people. Um, and there's an, how do we create that healthy community policing? And then if there is harm caused, how do we deal with that in a community policing setting? Okay, no doubt. That, that's, that's a heavy question. And, and, and what, I, I, five minutes, I, I see, sis, sis been like, she's cracking her knuckles like 20 minutes ago. That's why I went and sit down. They talking about questions. I'm like, talk to her. But anyway, um, no, so, so there's always going to be parasites. There's always going to be people that abuse power, so on and so forth. That's where the organizing takes place. You understand what I'm saying? You know, our motto is we love you, but we'll F you up. Because when it comes to our babies and when it comes to our community, it goes further and it goes deeper than that. Certain things, we're not calling the police. I'm not calling the police at all. We're going to figure it out. You understand what I'm saying? But you have to empower, and I don't even like to use the word police, right? We would say community patrol, right? Public safety, right? We have to, quote unquote, deputize brothers and sisters who have our best interests at heart. You understand what I'm saying? And they have to be monitored. And there has to be a process where if there is abuse, that they're able to be dealt with. See, the thing is about our warriors, when we talk about revolution, there's been blood oaths. And that's the part folks don't want to get down with. When you talk about blood oaths, you talking about that's a whole nother level. Because now we know that when you get in, get in a certain tier, we know that our babies, our women, our elders, our brothers, their lives are at stake. So if you mess up, then you already know that is problematic. Nobody's making no announcements. Nobody making no threats, nothing. I'm not even telling you, I'm not going no further than that. But there has to be accountability. And until there's accountability and responsibility, then we'll have nothing. The Ruba talks about part of the reason that the police kill us because there's not funerals on both sides. My brother Balagoon talks about humans that do more to escape pain and to gain pleasure. This is our soul. If we just keep talking about what if, then we're gonna be where we at. You know what I'm saying? And that's not to discount what you're asking because it's valid. But at the same time, we have to be clear that examples must be made. If we're talking about nation building, you're talking about sovereignty. You're talking about independence. So you shouldn't want the police on your land. It defeats the purpose. You understand what I'm saying? So until we get enough heart, because that's all it is, 
we fear them more than we fear ourselves. And until we get past that, this is going to be a convo that's going round and round. But I believe in us, and I know in the bottom of my soul and in the depths of wherever I might go, that we will be victorious. I know this. And if any of you doubt it, I'm sorry. I'm not taking this. I gave my life to this, baby. On the real, this, this is all I know. I'm not going out like no sucker. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not going out like that. But anyway, I appreciate y'all. Respect for time. I'm going to be here till tomorrow. So if anybody wants to rap, let's get down. Love y'all. Thank y'all so much. Nah, I mean, it's war.